Hello, I'm going to talk to you about some of the challenges involved in doing MR guided breast biopsies. So here's my learning objectives. I want you to be able to identify some of the common MR guided breast biopsy challenges, preferably prior to doing the procedure, and then be able to modify your procedure to overcome those challenges. So we've all dictated these kind of second look ultrasound reports when we've been looking at patients who have MR abnormalities and we put something like this and we um, can't find the lesion and so we're gonna recommend an MR guided biopsy. And depending on how much you enjoy a challenge, uh, your response to this might be, oh darn. Or perhaps you really like a challenge in which case you're kind of excited about doing this. So let's start with potential challenge number one. For some reason, about 90% of the time when you target a lesion, it seems to come out right at the plastic crossover the grid. It never seems to sort of end up right in the middle of the grid position here. Um, luckily, this is a pretty easy challenge to deal with. So if you're using um, automatic targeting software, it's going to do this for you. If you're doing it manually, you've got to work it out which of the nearest holes that you're going to go to, and you've often got four different choices there. Um, what you do need to do is be able to work out the direction that you need to biopsy in and to probably have the majority of your biopsies taken in that direction. Now, it's important that you do this targeting as um, in terms of nipple or chest or feet or head. In other words, you think that you've got a biopsy towards the chest and the feet in this patient to get the lesion effectively. We're used to routinely in mammography and also in stereo biopsies using clock faces. They're not going to help you here. Clock faces are going to get you very confused, so don't use clock faces. So, for example, if your uh, lesion is here with the yellow star shown um, on the standard sagittal and with the patient um, in the position they're really in, and the nearest block you've decided you're going to go into is shown here in green, and you've decided that you're going to go into that top uh, posterior corner, then you know that you need to take your biopsies towards the chest and towards the head in this patient. Challenge number two. So here is a series of images I'm going to show you. Um, here we have our lesion, which I'm going to mark with a star. And this is an image obtained after we've placed a fiducial. And you can see there is no fiducial in this image. So I'm going to scroll inferiorly. So here's our lesion, and we're coming down inferiorly, and I know that, and I know it's more inferiorly because I can look here on our particular machine that getting more negative means that you're going more inferior with the transaxial slices. And you can see here, we're now through the middle of the fiducial, I'm actually significantly inferior to this particular lesion. And you can calculate easily how many millimeters or you can measure it from the sagittal images. And you can see that I'm pretty good depth position, maybe just you know a tiny bit deep um, or medial to the um, lesion in this particular trocar. The trocar should be in the middle of the chamber, but that really looks pretty good. But I am definitely inferior. Or, so what do we do about fiducial mispositions? Um, my kind of rough guide is that if I'm within five or six millimeters, then I'm going to be okay as long as I take biopsies in that particular direction. Um, then I can pull enough tissue down with the vacuum to be able to do it. If it's more than that, then I'm probably going to reposition. So you're going to need to do a new skin lick. You're going to have to move fast because that contrast is washing out and you just have to explain to the patient afterwards that everything moved around and that's why she's got two little incisions. Um, now, if you're close enough, then decide if you need to withdraw the uh, fiducial slightly, so obviously with the cannula as well, or put the trocar back in and push it in a little bit further, and you can measure that on the axial images. And then again, work out which direction you need to biopsy. And again, you really need to use chest, nipple, head, and feet for your targeting here. Challenge number three. So here's our diagnostic study on this patient, and you can see, if you look here, that this is a very superficial lesion. In fact, when I measure the distance to the skin on, the, um, on a magnified image here, you'll see it's only about eight millimeters. Now, the regular biopsy chamber is two centimeters. So if you, and we aim to have the lesion right in the middle of the biopsy chamber. So if you've got a lesion which is, um, closer than about 12 millimeters to the skin, then you run the risk of taking a skin biopsy. 
And believe me, you can take a really significant skin biopsy. Um, that vacuum works really very well, and you can end up with a hole that's about an inch across if you're not careful by the time you've taken 12 biopsies. This is really kind of suboptimal. Now, um, the patient is going to be in more compression for the biopsy study than they are for the diagnostic study. So a lesion to skin depth that was, say, 10 millimeters on the diagnostic study might be only 7 millimeters for the biopsy. So what can we do? Um, use lots and lots of superficial lidocaine to kind of plump up that area of the breast and push the lesion a little deeper, same as we do with stereo. You can put the biopsy chamber deeper into the patient. So instead of aiming for the lesion to be in the center of the biopsy chamber, I'll show you a diagram in a moment, we can aim for it to be near the proximal end. Again, we use this in stereo quite a bit. We cannot use the needle block. I mean, one of the problems with the MR guided biopsies is you can't see what's happening to the skin behind that needle block. So um, if you don't use the needle block and you freehand it, it's obviously a little bit tricky. You've got to kind of calculate it carefully and watch that you're perpendicular to the skin. Um, you can see the skin. You can see what's going on. I've used this on a number of occasions. And then um, finally, you can use a petite needle. Now, the problem with the petite needle is that you're only going to have 50% of the sampling you do with a regular needle, so there's more chance of false negatives. So for um, just to show in a, a diagram here, so we usually aim for our lesion to be right in the middle of our biopsy chamber, but you can just push the needle deeper, making sure that that proximal end of the chamber is beneath the skin and biopsy like this, and that's what I tend to do if I have sufficient breast depth, or you can use a petite needle to the same effect. Challenge number four. So we seem to see these lesions a lot, these extreme posterior lateral lesions that can be really challenging to get them into the biopsy grid. But luckily, this, there are a number of things we can do, and you really need to work with your technologists here. The techs really need to know where that lesion is so they can position the patient adequately before you start the procedure. We often remove the padding on the coil, just putting a towel between the patient and the plastic. You can roll the contralateral side up. I'll show you a diagram in a sec. And the techs can really pull that tissue down. They really have to kind of work with the patient to get them relaxed and get that tissue down. It is very important that after they've acquired the initial set of sagittal images that you check before gadolinium in these kind of cases that the, the grid um, is placed um, posteriorly adequately. So what you don't want to find is after you've given gadolinium that the lesion is enhancing outside of the grid because you can't get at it in that situation. So I try and guesstimate where I think it's going to be on the sagittal images and make sure it's within the grid before I say it's okay to inject. Um, because the coil, depending on your type of device, may well overlay that post, most posterior um, set of grid holes, you may need to remove the coil for the biopsy and place it below the needle for imaging. Um, and fairly anything else, you can do MR-guided needle locs uh, safer with some angulation, um, which means you can't use a needle guide in that situation. Again, you have to freehand it a little bit, um, but that's much better than sort of taking big vacuum-assisted biopsies of the chest wall. So just to show you here, this is a, a posterior lateral lesion. It would have been outside the grid with conventional placement, but we roll patient up with the padding, we pull the breast tissue down, and we can get it within our imaging. And this is just to demonstrate what I was saying about the coil, that you often have to place the coil inferiorly to allow access to that most posterior row, row of grid holes. So this just showed an example in a patient. This was a nice posterior lateral lesion. You can see how close to pectoralis it is. If we just placed her routinely, there's no way we could have got at this. But our technologists use those tricks I just told you about here. This actually was not the lesion. This is actually this little blood vessel here, but you can see how much further anterior they got them because our grid is all the way back here. And see the shape of pectoralis showing us how much they've pulled that breast tissue down. And just to show you on the sagittal images, so here's our lesion. And if you look at the postglandular fat here, and that is here. So see how much tissue we've got down. We're not even seeing any of this prepectoral fat on the regular diagnostic study. Challenge number five. 
the disappearing lesion. Um, unfortunately, this happens not infrequently that a lesion you saw on the diagnostic study you no longer see when it comes to biopsy, and this can be for many reasons, um, including the image quality is not as good often on the biopsy studies, um, but um, also if it's related to fibrocystic change or hormonally changes, it may really truly have disappeared. Uh, if I see the lesion at all, even if very faintly on the biopsy study, I will go ahead and biopsy it. But what do you do if you truly can't see it? I think it's really important that you do warn patients about this possibility prior to doing the biopsy. Um, it's really tough for them if they're all kind of set up to go and then you suddenly call a halt in the middle um, without them having had that preparation. The first thing you want to check is whether there has been adequate contrast injection. Um, we all know that that sometimes gets infiltrated, so look at the heart, look at the blood vessels. If that's okay, you might want to consider overcompression of the breast. This is obviously best checked before you do the procedure, but if you overcompress the breast, you can prevent the contrast going in. Um, we sort of kind of prod the breast after it's been placed in the grid. It should feel the kind of density of a rare steak. Um, if it's feeling kind of more like a well-done steak, then it's probably too compressed and you should release it. Uh, if you are not getting enhancement of lesions and not getting contrast going in, uh, think about just releasing and rescanning if it's a bit tight. You can do delayed imaging and subtraction images. But if you really, really can't get any enhancement of this lesion, then stop the exam, reassure the patient. But you must do a repeat study in about three to six months because there is a 5 to 10% false negative rate in this situation. Challenge number six. So here we have the extreme medial lesion, which if anything is a little bit more tricky than the extreme posterior lateral lesion. Luckily, we could see this one by ultrasound because I don't think we could ever have biopsied it. And what we do with these is very similar to the extreme posterior lateral one. We're going to remove the padding. We're going to pull the breast down. This time, we roll up the ipsilateral side, as I'll show you in a diagram in a sec. Again, you should check those sagittal images pre-gadolinium for that grid position. Again, you may need to remove the coil to do the biopsy and place it below the needle. And again, um, an MR-guided needle loop with angulation may be required if you really can't biopsy it. So you can see here a, a, a very medial lesion would have been outside of the grid, but if we wedge up the ipsilateral side, roll the patient up, um, in this case, pull the breast tissue down and we can get it to within the grid. Challenge number seven. What about retroareolar regions, lesions? Uh, this one we could actually see by ultrasound, but sometimes we can't. And these can be challenging for a number of different reasons. They're very superficial to the nipple and you don't really want to excise the patient's nipple during this. And also the, the breast can be very thin in that area, depending on the size of the patient's breast. Another problem that you may not realize, and again, it's really important that the technologist is aware of where these lesions are, is that anteriorly the breast may not be well compressed. And so when you try and put in your trocar and then your fiducial to this area, it's very difficult to get accurate positioning. The whole breast kind of pushes away from you, you get a lot of skin tethering and a lot of mobility of the breast there. So if the tech knows that there is a retroareolar lesion, they can roll the breast a little bit and then place some padding to make sure that you have good contact between the grid and the skin at the place that you're going to want to put the needle in. So for retroareolar uh, lesions, you can roll the breast tissue a little bit so you can kind of bring that lesion back to a thicker part of the breast. Um, you can use a petite needle if the breast is very thin at this spot pad that anterior breast against the grid and use lots and lots of lidocaine. Um, this is a very sensitive area. Challenge number eight. It's very easy to get skin tethering, especially if you put the needle block in before you put the uh, needle in, um, because what happens is you cut, there's a little uh, plastic cannula, which is on the outside of your trocar, and there's a little kind of lip there and the, the skin catches against that lip as you're trying to push in um, the needle and it just shoves the skin in. And so this is going to mean that the lesion may push away from you and you have inaccurate positioning. You see a little bit of skin tethering here on this um, MR. 
So one way we've already talked about is to ensure good skin contact with the grid in the place that you want to put in. I always make my skin next larger for MR guided biopsies than I do with stereos because they're just that much trickier. And I also put my um, trocar and the cannula through that needle block and then through the skin before I insert that needle guide. Um, so you can just give it a little bit of rotation, make sure that the plastic is through the skin nick and then slide the needle block in. And I think this is a really good way. You're always gonna make sure that you've got good coverage of the skin by doing that. Challenge number nine. Oh yeah, who wants to biopsy this lesion? Um, implants, really fun to do MR guided biopsies on. Um, luckily this patient who we could not see this abnormality by ultrasound, we elected to do a six month follow up and it disappeared. Now, obviously, if you can have um, see it by ultrasound or stereo, you're going to do those um, for preference. But there are some things you can do. You can displace the implant away from the needle track in the same way as we do um, in stereo biopsies. But do remember that vacuum effect, especially if we're taking a um, lot of biopsies. I always do consent for collapse of the implant, um, even if I think it's unlikely. It's really important you do that. Um, you can really try to biopsy away from the implant. So um, if here's the breast, here's the implant, um, here's your lesion, then aim to put your needle in a grid position, which is going to be, say, posterior to the, to the lesion, but anterior to the implant here, and then only biopsy in that anterior direction, and that's going to give you a lot of safety there. Um, an MR-guided needle loc excision may be slightly safer if you think it's borderline. And there are some times where the only alternative there is is to perforate the implant. For example, if it was a lesion back here and if you, the patient, the surgeon, have discussed this in advance and consented and they're going to have an implant replaced, um, then you can go ahead and do it. I can tell you it's very unnerving. Um, you hear lots of <laughs> noises um, as that um, implant gets uh, contents get sucked up into your needle and um, your patient comes in a C cup and goes out an A. So for preference, obviously we don't do that. Just to show you here the effect of implant displacement on two lesions, the red lesion and the blue lesion here. This red lesion we were uh, able in this diagram to bring down by displacing the implant posteriorly, but we've got no hope of getting a lesion that's all the way back there. Challenge number 10 the very small and thin breast. Now, if you look at this scale here, you can see quite how small this breast is, and this is on the diagnostic study with no compression. So on the diagnostic study, this patient's breast weighs, it measures three centimeters. So on the um, compression study for the biopsy, it's probably gonna be more like two and a half. So for these, we probably try and reduce the compression as much as possible to be able to still hold the breast stably. This is the really good role of that petite needle with that you know, 12 millimeter chamber. And then again, plump up the breast with lidocaine as much as possible to try and reduce the chances of you doing a skin biopsy. So just to show you kind of what's gonna happen with your regular needle here, suboptimal result, I think we'll all agree, as opposed to using the petite needle. Again, you really wanna make sure that that plastic cannula is through the skin nick and protecting the skin. Challenge number 11, hematomas. So hematomas happen um, a lot more with MR-guided biopsies and they tend to with stereos or, or ultrasound-guided biopsies um, for a couple of reasons. One, we tend to take more biopsies. Uh, we conventionally take at least 12 for MR-guided biopsies. And second, the patient's breast is not being compressed for a protracted period of time when they're in the scanner, so you're more likely to get a hematoma. So I would definitely recommend, if you can get hold of it at the moment, um, using lidocaine with epinephrine for MR-guided biopsies. Um, I always, um, if I see a hematoma on my post-biopsy sequence, I'm going to go back in and vacuum it out before I put the clip in. And, you know, time and pressure is going to stop all bleeding. So prolonged compression is really important after MR-guided biopsies and then placing a compression dressing. Challenge number 12. So here is a small lesion right in the center of the breast, and here is the CC mammogram. 
performed following the MR guided biopsy, and you can see that the clip is absolutely nowhere close to the lesion site. And you can see that obviously this is going to lead to very challenging um, needle localization um, should this lesion need to be excised later. So this is, appears to be a significant issue for MR guided biopsies, and it's partially due to the larger cavity. It can certainly be made worse by hematomas. And we don't image our patients after we place the clip because we found that you know, the air and the blood and everything else means we can't see that clip to even be able to assess adequacy until we do the mammogram. I have found that if you withdraw the introducer about five millimeters before the deployment, after having um, vacuumed out any hematoma, it does help. And on occasions, I've had some, some success with um, going back in, taking the steri strips off, and then placing a clip using ultrasound guidance to the cavity, or even with a sort of blind guidance, guesstimating the amount of centimeters, um, and placing another clip afterwards. Challenge number 13. So this is a patient, this is their diagnostic study, and you can see that they had clumped linear enhancement in the lateral aspect of the left breast. Here's the post-biopsy cavity um, sequence, and you can see that, you know, it looks like we have a nice cavity right where we should have it, so the sampling looks good. Um, we were pretty suspicious about this. It was the only area of enhancement in this patient, and it came back as being fibrocystic change. So the question is, what do we do with discordant results? Um, this particular patient we followed up for two years and she was fine. And just to let you know some of the figures, the studies have shown that about 8 to 14% of targeted lesions are actually inadequately sampled if you do follow-up gadolinium MRs fairly soon after the uh, biopsy was done. And overall, about 2.5% are false negative for malignancy. So if you think it's a discordant result, um, first thing you need to do is check the adequacy of your biopsy, look at the cavity, look at the clip positions, and really try and correlate it well. And then depending on your level of suspicion for the lesion, there's some alternatives. Um, a short interval follow-up in six to eight weeks to see if you did actually get the lesion, rebiopsying, or doing an MR-guided needle localization if the patient's going to surgery, for example, fairly soon after you've done the biopsy study and they want to know definitively um, either of the lesion itself, or even if you think that the clip was really well placed, you could needle localization, needle localize the clip that you placed at biopsy and just make sure that the surgeon is fairly generous with their biopsy margins for that. And then finally, you'll be glad to know, challenge number 14. So many people are using CAD software for targeting, and when it works, it works really well, and when it doesn't work, it can be a bit of a disaster. You know, you don't have a lot of time to muck about and play around with software in the middle of these biopsies. So I would highly recommend that you know how to manually target a breast biopsy. It's so easy. It really, you know, this is not rocket science, and it means that you can quickly change. Um, and, you know, to be honest, I can do it as fast as I can do it on the targeting software, but you can quickly change in the middle over to manual targeting. All you have to do is calculate the depth, either from the sagittal slice positions or from the axial images, identify which grid you're going to go in relative to where the fiducial has been placed, and then identify the needle position in the grid square. So being a bit of a belt and suspenders sort of a gal, I always have um, one of these worksheets from our pre-CAD um, days with me at the biopsy so I can just flip over in a heartbeat to doing some very easy targeting. So I'm going to walk through the method for manual targeting. So as one of my residents said when we were going through a little workshop on this, oh, this is just battleships, and it really is. So the first thing you're going to need is to make sure that you have the correct grid. Um, so I'm uh, showing you here that the, there's two different um, worksheets. There's going to be the lateral right or medial left, and then there's going to be the opposite to that. And I always, uh, if, while I'm planning the procedure, I kind of draw the breast on, looking at the size of the breast in the woman, and I'm going to tell the technologist where I think the lesion's going to be so that they just have some idea of how they need to place that breast. Here's the opposite sheet, and you can see here, this is the lateral left and medial right. So let's run through a lesion to show you the process. So this is a patient who has a slightly 
lateral lesion in the middle of their right breast. So I'm going to come from a lateral approach here. And you can see on the sagittal, it's in the upper part of the breast. So here we are. Here is our sagittal post gadolinium um, study from the biopsy study. We can see our lesion nicely here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to identify my location, the sagittal slice here. It's at 79.7 uh, millimeters, image 14. I'm going to put an X on the lesion and then you scroll back until you find the grid. So here we are, we're scrolling back, going to grid, and you can see I've cursor there, just left it be on the lesion. And usually once we get the grid, we've usually got about three different slices that we see the grid on. So I take the middle of those slices. I'm just going to go a bit further so you can see that. Now you can see on this slice we're now well through the grid face, which is the area that we want to be able to calculate our depth from, but we can now see that the fiducial was placed before and we can work out what square that fiducial is in relative to our cursor position. So in this case, we can see that our cursor was one square um, towards the head. So one grid square towards the head relative to the cursor. And it's in the upper outer quadrant of that square. And you can go back and forth um, between the different sagittal slices to confirm that. So just to show you back a sagittal slice my grid lines are here. I know that my fiducial is in this square here from the previous image, and you can see where the X falls within that square. I know I need to go one grid square towards the patient's head, and I know that I want to put my biopsy needle in the top right-hand corner right here. Now, how do we calculate depth? There's two ways of calculating depth. You can use your location where the lesion was. So here, 79.7. And then use the sagittal location where your grid face is. I say as you take like the uh, middle three of where I think the face is, 97.7, and subtract the two. Or if you obtain an axial image, you can just calculate the depth very easily like that. I actually do both and just make sure that they're both concordant. Told you I'm a belt and suspender sort of a person. So this is pretty easy now. We know that our fiducial was sitting here. We knew that it was in the C4 square when we placed it. We know from the images that we had to go one towards their head um, in this square here. In this case, it's labeled C5, and we knew we wanted to go in the top right-hand corner. So we mark that on the image view, and then we're going to convert that over to the patient view. So I know that my little block is going to be in square C5, so I've got that marked. I know it's going to be on C5 with B6, C5 with B6, and that's where my needle position is going to be. And then you just convert it here to the needle guide using their worksheet. And you can see here, I've calculated my depth of distal grid face, my depth of target, subtracted the two to come up with 18 millimeters, which is almost exactly the same as I measured on the transaxial images. And at this point, you're then just going to go on and use this sheet to be able to identify where you're going to put your needle block in and um, where you place your needle within the needle block as you would with the printed CAD copy. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Happy to answer any questions if you want to email me.